Um, uh, my talk today is about a, a pretty new piece of work that I, um, I've been doing with uh, Innes and the other members of Explosion AI on uh, uh, connecting Spacey to uh, the latest NLP models, which are these transformer models. Uh, so this is the first time I've given this talk, so it, there may be bits where it's a little bit rough, and as I said, the work's very much in progress, so some of the things which I'll be describing are basically the intended functionality or how things will be, will be working in the future rather than what uh, exactly can be used if you install the, uh, the package right away. So just as a bit of background, um, so I'm the developer of this open source library, Spacey. Um, I've been working on natural language processing for pretty much my whole career. Uh, I was lucky enough to get into the field when it was still quite small. Uh, uh, I finished my PhD in 2009. Uh, and then around 2014, I decided to leave academia, basically at the point where I would have had to start writing grant proposals, and uh, decided to start working on uh, this open source library, Spacey. Uh, and uh, my main uh, uh, colleague on this is my co-founder, Innes, who'll be talking tomorrow in the keynote session, uh, who's also been working on Spacey pretty much since uh, its first release. So this is, uh, you know, you can find Spacey at the uh, Spacey.io. It has uh, quite good documentation, and as I said, it's quite popular these days. So we've, it's always hard to estimate usage for an open source library, but we figure we've probably got at least 100,000 users who are, uh, you know, basically using the library quite actively, uh, and we've got, um, you know, many styles on GitHub, like around 15,000. So the other main project that we do uh, at Explosion AI, um, uh, the company that Innes and I co-founded is this annotation tool Prodigy. Uh, so uh, this is especially useful in conjunction with Spacey because it lets you basically train your own models for Spacey. So if you want to train your own named entity recognition models or train your own uh, text classification models, Prodigy is a very easy way to do that. And it's also an easy way to basically have a little bit of interactivity in your local data science workflow so that you can do sort of error analysis and basically have a, a deeper connection to the data. Because often when you're doing things like natural language processing, uh, the uh, being able to look at the data and basically think about what to do next is much more important than deciding like you know what model architecture to try or uh, these sorts of things and uh, it's actually prodigy that was a special motivation for the transformers work that I'll be talking about uh, because the uh, these developments in transfer learning that uh, you know, the Spacey Transformers package that will help you use are especially useful uh, in conjunction with an annotation tool to basically uh, allow you to take, make use of the fact that you now need so much less training data. Uh, so as with uh, Spacey, the uh, Prodigy tool is uh, quite, um, uh, really quite popular. We've got a lot of uh, uh, users using it, including a lot of companies. And this is actually how we support the development of Spacey. It's uh, sales of Prodigy that are funding the Explosion AI uh, company. Okay, so on to, you know, basically what I'll be talking about here. So I don't know how many of you have heard of transformer models. Um, I won't do the, you know, asking people to raise their hands because, you know, generally nobody does. Um, but uh, it, there's been a lot of headlines around this and a lot of excitement. Um, so uh, the idea here is that it's, you know, basically been a, a goal of natural language processing to move through what's called this knowledge acquisition bottleneck. And this is really the problem that uh, in any language processing application, there's a lot of knowledge about word usage and knowledge about the world, which generalizes across tasks uh, and is really hard to encode for a specific task that you want to do. So you want to solve a particular problem like uh, sorting uh, your support tickets into um, n different categories. And uh, if you have to learn all of the information from that, from uh, tickets that you've already classified, the problem's really hard. And uh, the obvious observation is that most of the information that's in those tickets are things that anybody knows from a whole host of other background tasks. It's not information which is specific to the problem that you're trying to solve. So what we want to be able to do is uh, uh, gain that knowledge from somewhere else, some general um, sort of knowledge of the language, and then uh, be able to reuse that knowledge across different applications in just the same way as if you were teaching somebody to do this task, you would expect them to know uh, the language and be able to read the tickets and then o build on top of that the specific knowledge about what your classification scheme is. So uh, although this had been a goal of natural language processing for, you know, basically since the field had begun, efforts to use raw text uh, in uh, this way were not working that well before neural networks. And even after neural networks came out, uh, the initial 
ways that we could reuse uh, raw text resources and gain knowledge of raw text uh, was really limited to basically the dictionary level or the meaning of individual words. And so uh, what's happened over the last couple of years is we've really just gotten much better at uh, uh, importing knowledge from raw text into our applications, including knowledge from raw text about the context of words and these contextual representations. So that's really what these transformers, transformer models do. Uh, and that's what the sort of knowledge that we want to connect here. Um, so uh, this was all nicely summarized in a blog post by Sebastian Ruder. Uh, in the, if you want to look it up, the blog post is called NLP's ImageNet Moment Has Finally Arrived. And this is really an analogy with computer vision where people import knowledge from uh, computer vision tasks um, uh, and basically reuse that into uh, um, you know, other um, more specific computer vision uh, models. Okay, so, um, uh, and then of course this was uh, you know, culminated in a, an article about the New York Times, and it did sort of blow my mind a little bit that this field that I had started off in in 2009, that you know, what was actually kind of an incremental update in this ends up being like for, uh, news in like a major publication. So you can kind of see how the field has evolved and how this has kind of made a mainstream splash. So um, in practice, the way that a lot of people are using these transformer models in their applications is via a, uh, a package developed by the, um, our friends at Hugging Face. And this is um, started off being called, um, uh, I think it was like BERT PyTorch Transformers or um, PyTorch BERT. Then it became PyTorch Transformers. And now it's just Transformers because it supports TensorFlow as well. So this is a, um, a really quite a popular library. And it gives you a pretty easy way to use pre-trained weights. So the models take a long time to kind of calculate on the raw text and uh, cost quite a lot of money, um, uh, several thousand dollars in many cases. Uh, but uh, this gives you an easy way to use the, those model artifacts that people have um, uh, developed. And uh, even if the models have been trained with um, TensorFlow, they kind of translate them into uh, PyTorch so that you can use them in PyTorch. Um, so uh, this is like a, a quick view of what the API looks like, but basically you get an easy way to load them up. So once this was developed, we said, all right, well, now that we've got this um, you know, nice way to use the models in PyTorch, we want to uh, basically have a connection for this for Spacey. So uh, this is the Spacey Transformers library, and this is kind of uh, what the usage of it looks like. Um, and also what the pipeline here looks like. So as with other Spacey models, um, you'll call uh, uh, spacey.load um, to load up a pre-trained uh, model. The models are distributed, um, uh, kind of packaged as pip packages so that uh, an individual um, package can have dependencies and basically declare itself that way and you can serve it out to your applications in exactly the same way as you're serving uh, you know, all of the other um, uh, Python dependencies. So it's kind of uses standard tools and it's kind of easy to work with that way. Um, and then uh, this NLP object can be just used as a function, so you can call it with a single text. You can also call it with batches of text with um, NLP.pipes, and it will uh, do the mini batching internally for efficient processing. So, um, so all right, what can we do with this? Well, out of the box, um, uh, it, before we connect on a, um, a model which is trained for your specific task, there's actually not that much that we can do, but we can already say, all right, we can kind of get a similarity judgment. It may not uh, match the similarity that you want for a particular application, but you can at least look at how similar the different vectors are. Um, and then you can also access the, um, uh, the representations that have been assigned to the, um, uh, to the tokens by um, uh, the transformer model. And then importantly, um, uh, one of the uh, quite neat usage things that we were um, uh, pleased to develop is that the transformer models tend to use a non-linguistic tokenization scheme uh, in order to limit the number of different vocabulary words. So they tend to basically divide up a single uh, word that's, um, as long as the word's rare, so something like Chennai might be in two tokens, Chen and Nai. Uh, and it does this so that the model doesn't have a, um, an unboundedly large uh, vocabulary of words to deal with. Now, of course, when you actually go to use the models, the fact that you don't have a vector that represents an actual word for your application is quite a pain. Um, so what we do in, um, uh, the Spacey PyTorch, in the Spacey Transformers library is basically just do this alignment process so that uh, even if you want to work with, at the word level later on, um, you're able to get a word representation out of um, these BERT models or um, uh, uh, Excelnet models um, uh, and use that to um, uh, use the alignment to basically give you a representation that, for the uh, words that you actually want to work with. Um, so here you can see a bit. Uh, here you can see this about the alignment. Um, 
uh, we basically ask whether we've got something like Laced, which has been split up into two tokens by um, uh, the word piece tokenization, and we align those back up to Laced um, uh, here, so that when we are calculating the vectors, we can ab able to say, ask what's the vector representation for Laced, rather than just what's the representation for L and Aced. So um, uh, after you add something like a text classifier model uh, onto the end, we can say, um, all right, uh, we'll use Spaces API for text classification, so you can uh, use it within your NLP pipeline, and uh, you can um, uh, train this text classifier um, and have it back propagate into uh, the BERT model or um, uh, other transform model, so that you're learning a, um, a very accurate text classification model using these um, uh, transform models. And then soon we'll have other pipeline components that work in the same way. Now, um, as soon as you have multiple pipeline components here, though, there's a bit of a, um, a challenge for uh, the design of these things. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about in this next section and talk about different trade-offs here and different ways that we want this to work. So uh, first, uh, here's a little bit of background about the way that Spacey does um, uh, components and the kind of component system that we have here. Um, so what you're able to do is, um, uh, at least in Spacey Transformers, and this is coming soon to the Spacey library as well, you can decorate a function and describe it as a, a basically register it as a way to um, describe a model architecture. Um, so that uh, then uh, in your components, you can swap out these um, model architectures in the config files. Um, and you can you know, basically bring, bring your own architecture or define your own architectures for these things. So here we've... Um, another nice detail here is that Spacey has basically this interface library, um, Think, which does its machine learning. Um, and uh, we have a wrapper for PyTorch that um, uh, you can put around the PyTorch models to use them in Spacey with no copies involved. Uh, so you can use um, a custom PyTorch layer and use it to power a Spacey component. Um, even if it's not a, a transform model, you'll be able to do the same thing, even if you just want to say you as a BioSTM tagger or some other uh, custom PyTorch um, model. And as soon as uh, TensorFlow 2 supports this DL pack uh, format, you'll be able to do the same with TensorFlow. So what you would do if you wanted to define a new component for, say, a new um, uh, NLP task that you wanted to solve, um, you would subclass this uh, NLP pipe, um, this spacey pipeline.pipe uh, component. Um, you would define your, um, this function that returns a model. Um, you don't really have to do much here. You basically can just use the uh, registry system here uh, and just pass it its config through. Um, and that will you know, basically do enough to uh, instantiate the model architecture that you've defined up here. Um, and then the other parts of the life cycle that you'll want to define is there's um, a, a predict method where you can say, okay, extract some features from the docs, like, you know, their uh, word IDs or um, any other types of features that you want your model to have access to. And then you would pass that uh, representation forward in your model um, and then return the scores from it. Uh, then uh, you have the opportunity to set any annotations based on those scores. So uh, let's say you wanted to have custom... Um, uh, uh, features or custom um, attributes that you wanted to define for some task that Spacey doesn't support. You can have extension attributes and basically calculate all of the things to update the doc objects that you want to work with. Uh, and then finally, you can have an update function, which will, um, uh, you know, basically uh, allow you to um, uh, calculate a weight update for your model based on some gold standard information and based on a batch of documents. So this is all very nice. This is you know, basically how a pipeline component works in Spacey. And once you've defined it, you can add it to your Spacey pipeline. Uh, you can register it as um, an entry point so that you can have a package that basically people can just pip install and your component will be all available and ready to use. So that you can extend Spacey in these ways. So uh, if we imagine this kind of like, you know, working through with multiple um, pipeline components, let's say we've got some text. Uh, Spacey will tokenize that into a doc object. And then inside the NLP call or NLP pipe method, you'll call the uh, something like the named entity recognizer and then call the text classifier. And as you're going through, you'll update annotations in the doc and then get out a doc object. Cool. OK. So now one question here is how does this all work when we're also updating the, the models? So if we um, let's imagine that uh, we have our transformer models here and we've got, say, a named entity recognition head on top of a transformer, and then also a text classification head that's on top of a transformer. So how should this work? Should we have two copies of the transformer models, or should we have only have one? Do we want to... Um, so the transformer models are quite slow to run, they, and they require pretty expensive hardware. So do we really want to be running the model twice, um, especially if it's quite similar, 
um, or do we want to run it once and sort of reuse the, um, uh, that result through it? So here's kind of like the sketch of the architecture of what it would look like if we want to run it once and update. So here we would say, OK, um, have this component token vector encoder, which will run the transform model, um, put the, uh, uh, set all of the vectors up on the doc object, um, set all of those extension attributes that we had, and then uh, we, uh, we can um, pass that doc forward. The named entity recognizer will make use of those features that the token vector encoder extracted, um, and then it's uh, able to pass gradients back into that model so that we can update it. And then similarly, we can move forward into the text classifier, and the text classifier can also make use of the information that was um, calculated back there and also update that single shared representation. So on some way, so to, um, in other words, this can be described as multitask learning. But uh, it's really just a question of whether we want to run early and set state or whether we want to have all of these things be independent. So there's actually you know, quite an old general trade-off that we have in code around here. So the question is whether we want to have um, more modular uh, components that are independent and don't depend on much state externally, or do we want to sort of um, uh, have a more complicated setup with more assumptions and therefore gain better efficiencies? Uh, and that's <coughs> definitely not a, um, you know, a question that is only going to uh, come up in uh, machine learning. This is something that we um, uh, you know, have to figure out with code all the time, um, these trade-offs around making something more modular and making it run more efficiently or um, uh, you know, in uh, some cases actually perform better in terms of accuracy. So here's what it would look like in this sort of alternate architecture. Here we would have um, uh, an individual named entity recognize a component, and it will kind of own its own transformer weights. So uh, we don't have any multitask learning here, and we have kind of like you know some nice architectural simplicity where we don't have to depend as much on previous um, uh, you know computations. And similarly, we'll pass forward in the tech classifier, and then we'll run the transformer again. We'll run a completely separate set of transformer weights. So again, this has like you know some problems. Um, uh, not least of which, if you're running this on a machine with only one GPU, you're actually going to uh, really struggle with memory here because you're probably going to have all of this um, uh, stuff set up in memory and uh, then a whole separate um, uh, model loaded in memory. And you may run out of memory if uh, you know because even if your card has say 12 gigabytes of GPU memory, the transformer models are so large that actually you. Um, uh, you may still struggle here. So you end up having to provision machines with multiple GPUs, and as your pipeline grows and you, say, have you know, more of these components, you have to ask questions about how many, uh, what's the nature of the software that I'm running and what machines do I have to provision it. So the, uh, so the deployment and you know, infrastructure questions start to get quite tricky, um, where um, you know, even one little config change in your, um, in your config file to, say, load a different component, um, means that a whole different hardware has to be provisioned. And if you over-provision the hardware, you'll find that it's like costs thousands of extra dollars a month because the GPUs, especially on cloud, are um, quite expensive. So we have like, you know, basically this dilemma. So to summarize the dilemma here, um, uh, you know, we, uh, there's really strong code uh, motivations for wanting a modular architecture. We want the functions to be small and self-contained, um, and uh, our systems are much more, much uh, easier to reason about if we avoid state and side effects. And um, of course, we can compose lots of, lots of different systems from a smaller number of um, uh, coded parts. So we get lots of code reuse and lots of co uh, combinations, and we can get lots of complexity resulting from a small amount of code, which is great. Uh, but on the other hand, well, performance. Uh, so uh, if we divide up our work into lots of small functions, we have to repeat lots of work a lot of the time. We can't make as many assumptions about the total computation that's running, and so we can't optimize as efficiently. Um, another thing is that without uh, that state, models can lose information, and that can actually um, uh, limit the number of features or what, uh, how we can actually define our models, and that can actually also result in less accuracy. Finally, I think that you know, something that is unique to machine learning when we're making this sort of trade-off is that models are often not that interchangeable. So uh, the behavior of one model, even if it has the same sort of signature, as long as it's trained differently, it's going to have different behaviors. Uh, and that means that you really, it actually becomes quite difficult to compose the pipelines together um, and to treat these different building blocks as actually um, interchangeable units. Um, and I think that that's actually a good motivation to take a different approach here. And uh, instead of making things as modular as possible, in some, in some ways, we may want to change this. So um, 
in Spacey, actually, initially, we had a very non-modular architecture because the tagger um, was used as a feature in the parser, and then uh, the parser's features were used in the named entity recognition. So, uh, and this actually defined the way that the Spacey API was um, worked initially, um, and it sort of def uh, informed the way that Spacey's API has worked since. So that's why you load up this one model, and it uh, gives you a whole set of components that are defined together. Like you load up a whole configured pipeline, rather than a um, uh, an API which, uh, you know, where you might say, okay, I'll load up, like, I'll initialize a pipeline and then I'll add the components that I want to it and then I'll run, um, which in some ways would seem like a, you know, more modular design. Um, uh, the decision was made to give it um, this sort of style uh, because if there's only one valid combination of the components and only one valid ordering, it doesn't actually make sense to make people, you know, chant that incantation every time. If there's only one answer, you don't have to make people code it up, you should just, like, do it. Um, so that's why it's sort of worked this way, and um, you know the same trade-off is now being seen in the transformer models. So for V2 at least, um, uh, we managed to break these dependencies and ha make things a bit more uh, modular. So the tag it doesn't actually depend on the previous state in uh, uh, the V2, V2.1, and V2.2 models, because you know as I said, it's nice to have things modular, but um, uh, now that we're moving to transformers, we actually want to have a slightly different approach. So. Moving forward to kind of the conclusion thing of the talk, um, uh, the pros and cons of the transformers are that um, the transformer architecture really makes it easy to define networks for new tasks. There's kind of a clear right answer, a clear template to follow for how to add new heads and how to do things. Um, you get great accuracy. The accuracy improvements have been really, you know, quite remarkable and they keep coming out. So we're, you know, really moving up in accuracy quite quickly, which makes um, the models very much easier to use in applications because you can reason about the, you can kind of expect decent performance, which makes the, really takes a lot of the guesswork out. Um, and uh, a big improvement as well is that you need fewer annotator annotated examples, and that really helps you move quickly. Um, uh, and you can iterate much quicker um, on the, the tasks and you know, basically reason about things much more easily. Um, but you know, the sort of uh, significant downsides are that um, the models are slow and expensive. They take uh, expensive GPUs to run, and uh, they particularly take large batches of text to operate efficiently. And that means that if you're using them in a streaming environment or something, then it's, they're very hard to deploy. Um, and also the fact that the models are quite bleeding edge and things are changing quickly around this space is also a significant downside for using your, them in your applications. So for Spacey Transformers, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, uh, for the code example, you can add different uh, architectures on this. Um, and uh, what you'll uh, be able to do is um, add on a text classifier and an identity recognizer and have those use the same shared states that you can only calculate the, um, uh, the tensors once and then uh, reuse those. So that's a you know, key way that we want to make this uh, work. So uh, at the moment, um, uh, you can already do pip install spacey transformers. Um, uh, we support uh, TextCat, um, uh, so text classification models. Uh, we have the aligned tokenization working, and there's already a pretty nice system for defining custom models or custom uh, you know, architectures and things. Um, uh, we're most of the way through def uh, designing the named entity recognition component. Uh, the tagging component will be pretty easy to do as well, and I think the dependency parsing model should follow afterwards. Um, uh, then another thing that we really want to get working is having a, a remote procedure calls for the transformer components so that you can host the, just the transformer on a GPU server, um, have it do the batching for you, and uh, you know, have the rest of your pipelines on the CPU and calling into it. I think that that'll be a really um, effective way to ease somebody's efficiency requirements and ease somebody's deployment requirements as well. Uh, and then uh, finally, we are very excited about having support for the transformer models in Prodigy, uh, our annotation tool, because um, in many cases, you only need a few hundred examples to get decent performance with these transformer models because of the power of the transfer learning. Uh, and this means that having an annotation tool that's scriptable that you can run locally and sort of very quickly click through and uh, save the results out into a database uh, that's just running on your local machine um, will be very uh, useful. And so uh, we're very excited to have that working. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Honorable and then uh, uh, Explosion at Explosion. So. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matthew, for the talk. And uh, we have enough time for Q&A. So anyone have questions? Yeah, over here. Uh, first row. Right. 
Hello, am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Okay, so uh, my question is already uh, Spacey had uh, NER algorithms like trigram, CNN based algorithms and things like that. So for a small uh, uh, data set like say 500, 600K uh, and then uh, re records, is it worth taking all the pain of transformers uh, when already the things are pretty much working? So. Uh, um, okay, so I'm not en entirely sure I uh, got the question. Is it that um, uh, if you have you know, a, um, a small and moderately sized data set uh, and you're uh, getting decent performance with Spacey, uh, yeah, yeah. is it likely to be worth the trouble of um, switching over to uh, the transform models? Yeah. Um, I would say probably not, um, especially since the fact that you have to run them on GPU really makes life difficult for um, many applications. On the other hand, um, there, are, there are lots of situations where um, you basically load up your data set and you don't immediately get good performance. And this happens in machine learning all the time. And uh, this can actually be quite uh, tricky to solve because you don't know what to try next. And you actually don't even know whether the task can be solved. So um, I would say that one of the great things about having tra the transform models is sort of like getting a peek at the answer where you can say, all right, is there an existence proof for what sort of accuracy could be achieved? And let's say you try out a simpler model, like a bag of words model even, or um, uh, with scikit-learn, or you try out spacey model, or some other thing, uh, and you get, say, 70% accuracy. And then you load up um, the transformer model, and you get, like, 92% um, accuracy. It makes you think, well, OK, if I'm only getting, like, a little bit better than a bag of words, or, you know, my bag of words model is getting this, um, what could I actually do? And it makes you think, well, maybe I should change my features a little bit, or even just try a little bit harder to um, uh, train the other, the simpler model. Another thing you can do is use the transform model to label text for the simpler model. Even if you don't want to deploy the transform model, you might be able to say, well, um, I'll use it and I'll train from the 92% accurate data, and then maybe I'll recover some of the accuracy and get up to, say, 84%. But if the model's already getting decent performance, there's always no end of other things you can do. So, um, you know, typically uh, there's a lot of other work in getting the application working correctly and, um, uh, you know, trying out different ideas. So if you, once you already hit acceptable accuracy and you're kind of at the like, uh, you know, the top end of the curve where, you know, always performance has this S shape, you, if you think, well, I'm not getting that much utility from extra accuracy, there's definitely no point in moving on with that and you probably want to prioritize different work. Hello. Uh, so, uh, Hugging Face uh, recently released their uh, distal bird model. Hello? Hey, here. Yeah. Um, uh, could you repeat that slightly? Yeah, so Hugging Face uh, recently released their distal bird model and the distal GPT 2 model, which is much performance wise much faster than the original bird. So, is Spacey already have support for that or do we have to port it to Spacey? Somehow? Okay, so. Um, is the question whether uh, we, which models we support or like whether we support Distilbert specifically? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, uh, yes, we have a package for Distilbert. Um, and in fact, the process for um, uh, creating the spacey packages is very uh, quick. So there's a single script that runs that basically downloads the pre-trained model and packages it up for spacey. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, we've got this added to our model automation now. So, um, uh, we added support for Distilbert within like, you know, a day of it being announced and actually most of the wait was waiting for the PyTorch Transformers library to release a new version that included the support for it. So I think you'll be able to expect pretty quick support for new architectures as they come out and we already do support Distilbert, which I'm excited to experiment with. Thank you. Hi. Hi, this side. Yeah. Hi. Here. Mm -hmm. Here. So uh, this is a generic question about the packaging of uh, Spacey pre-trained NEM models. Uh, more often, uh, when we try to use Spacey inside Databricks or any proprietary, uh, uh, let's say, PC which is from any corporate, since the uh, Spacey NEM models are not coming up with the package of Spacey itself, we are facing problem on installing them differently. So is there a plan as in probably to get rid of that? Um, I'm sorry to... The speakers are a little bit distorted, and I like I really didn't catch that. And I think we're actually at the end of the, um, yeah. so, the question. So, uh, when we use uh, Spacey NER models, the Spacey pre-trained NER models, we have to install each language model separately after we install Spacey. Yes. 
So that is creating a lot of problem when we try to use that in Databricks or probably in any proprietary uh, system. Okay, well, um, you can always just, um, the models are just um, uh, these like tar files that are served out of GitHub and uh, you can point spacey to a, a directory instead of a, um, a package. So if, you, if your deployment needs to um, refer to them as directories instead of as, um, uh, you know, basically pip packages, you can do that. But um, you can also just download the, um, uh, the archives and however you're installing spacey, you should be also be able to install the models. So um, there should be a range of ways that you can solve this sort of problem. So, uh, the challenge if you could have seen in Databricks is uh, the moment we do that, every time we install it, uh, every time we restart the cluster, we have to install again. So um, I'm sorry, but I think we're out of time and uh, we can talk about this offline. Sure. Um, so, thanks.